Take three. Hello and welcome to February 2024 in Paleontology. Huge thank you to Edge for inviting me to participate in this year's Paleo Rewind, and if you haven't seen the January episode yet, go check it out, it's on Dinofax's page. February was a great month for the discovery of brand new fossil animals, starting with, on February 1st, two new species of fossil sharks from all the way back in the Permian period found in Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. Glickmanius cariforum is a new species in a known genus, whereas Troglocladotus trimblii represents a brand new genus. They lived about 330 million years ago, and just to give you a sense of how old that is, if you followed your family tree all the way back to where it meets up with the ancestry of birds and lizards, that's when these sharks lived. Both of these animals were about 10 to 12 feet long when they were alive, although those kinds of life reconstructions are really difficult to do in shark paleontology. That's because sharks have cartilaginous skeletons which tend not to fossilize very well, so actually most fossil sharks are only known from teeth. That is the case with Troglocladotus, although excitingly, Glickmanius cariforum is known also from part of a jaw. Also, just on a personal note, I reported on this story when it first came out in February, because obviously I did, it's really cool, and in the months since, I've actually got in touch with J.P. Hodnett, the Park Service paleontologist who led this discovery, and I actually got to be part of his most recent expedition to Mammoth Cave. I didn't find anything super groundbreaking, but there are now Mammoth Cave specimens with my name on them, which is just really exciting for me. We also had a new genus and species of sauropod dinosaur from the late Jurassic Dongxing formation of southern China, Jingya dongxingensis. Jingya was a mamenchi saurid, and you know how the sauropods are the dinosaurs with the long necks? So the mamenchi saurids had insanely long necks, even by sauropod standards. In fact, the type genus, Mamenchisaurus itself, had a neck that was almost half the length of the entire animal. Now, we don't actually have a neck from this new genus, Jingya, but its relationship to the other mamenchi saurids suggests that it probably had similarly preposterous proportions. Staying in southern China, but jumping ahead to the early late Cretaceous, February also saw the announcement of the discovery of a brand new genus and species of ankylosaur, or armored dinosaur, which has been given the name Datai Inyangis. It was found in the Gangzhou formation of southeastern China, which is enticingly undersampled. In fact, not only is Datai the first dinosaur known from the Gangzhou, but it's actually the first definitive vertebrate period. So this is a really exciting clue that there are almost certainly more mind-blowing fossils yet to be found in the Ganjo. As for the animals themselves, they had these kind of interesting double cheek horns, and they represent an intermediate evolutionary stage between the earliest ankylosaurs and the more derived ankylosaurines of the later Cretaceous. And yes, that is animals plural, and yes, this is one of those fossils that will make you emotional lying awake at three in the morning. Or at least it's going to make me emotional lying awake at three in the morning. There were two of them in this fossil. They were not full grown when they died. They died together and their bodies were found with one lying on top of the other. Not only is that heartbreaking and intriguing, but it also provides even more evidence for an existing hypothesis that juvenile ankylosaurs traveled and lived together in groups. There was also a new genus and species of hadrosaur, or duck-billed dinosaur, from the very latest Cretaceous of what is now Morocco, which has been given the name Mincaria bata. This animal was three and a half meters long when it died, but it had a fused brain case, which means it was probably full-grown, even though that's pretty small for a hadrosaur. It was a lambiosaurine, which means it was related to more famous animals like Parasaurolophus, or Parasaurolophus, if you're like really nerdy about it. But the fact that Mincaria was a lambiosaurine actually represents something of a mystery because, you see, lambiosaurines didn't evolve until early Cretaceous North America, but the continent of Africa had been separate from all other continents since the mid-Jurassic. So how did Mincaria's ancestors get to Africa? Well, what probably happened is something that would have been comically terrifying for the dinosaurs. They were probably washed out to sea, 
probably in a storm, at which point they probably rafted on some drifting vegetation all the way to the continent of Africa. And if that sounds far-fetched to you, like, fair enough, but it's actually the leading hypothesis for a bunch of other natural ocean crossings as well. Like, it's also how we think the first lemurs got to Madagascar, and it's how we think the first monkeys got to South America. February also saw humanity's formal introduction to a very exciting new pterosaur from the Jurassic period of the Isle of Skye, Cheoptera evansae. Cheoptera had a 1.6 meter wingspan, which I happen to know converts to 5 foot 3 because that's exactly one astrid, and while it was an exciting animal in its own right, it also fills in a temporal and evolutionary gap in the pterosaur fossil record. You know how bird bones are famous for being super light and brittle to assist in flight? So compared to the bones of other flying vertebrates, bird bones are actually fairly robust, whereas pterosaur bones looked like this. So this did the job while the animal was alive, but then in most cases afterwards it turned immediately to dust, which means the pterosaur fossil record is extremely spotty. Pterosaurs evolved out of mm, at some point before the late Triassic, because that's when they start actually showing up in the fossil record. They survived the end Triassic mass extinction, and in the early Jurassic, a group called the Dimorphodontids were fairly successful, we think, or at least we have fossils of them. Then the trail goes cold for 20 million years. There's this huge temporal gap in the pterosaur fossil record where you'll find, like, a fragment this big of a single bone that's just enough to say it was some kind of pterosaur, but almost never an entire bone, let alone more than one bone from the same animal. Then the late Jurassic rolls around, and this group called the Ramphorhynchids show up, and they are fairly successful until the Cretaceous, when a different, unrelated pterosaur lineage called the Pterodactyloids appear out of nowhere and take over the Cretaceous skies. So there's two big questions here. One, what was going on in that 20 million year gap? And two, where did the pterodactyloids come from? This is where Cheoptera comes in. So not only is it an unusually complete, although still not complete, pterosaur fossil from that 20 million year gap, but it also represents a member of the mysterious evolutionary stem lineage that led to the pterodactyloids of the Cretaceous period. And because we have so relatively much of this animal, these paper authors used its remains to clarify some of those more fragmentary pterosaur remains from the same time period. Because finally, we have something to compare them to. All in all, a really satisfying and exciting and important discovery. February also brought something of a bombshell for small reptile paleontology. This is Tridentinosaurus antiquus. It was discovered in 1931 and comes to us all the way from the early Permian period, which makes it one of the oldest fossil reptiles known from the Italian Alps. It's also one of the only fossils from this time period and this region which preserves soft tissue, which is what this dark outline around the skeleton is. Or so we thought until this paper came out. This study took a detailed look at the composition of this fossil using UV photography, electron microscopy, and a few other techniques, and found that the famous soft tissue outline around the Tridentinosaurus fossil is paint. This is a historical forgery. Which is sad, but it's also just weird. Like, this is peak lily gilding, because this fossil was already super cool. It's still a really cool fossil. It's still one of the oldest reptiles from the Italian Alps. I can't relate to this person in the early 1930s who found this and said, ah, not cool enough, gotta add something fake to it. Weird. So Baby's first narrative of deep geologic time goes something like, there was the age of reptiles, when reptiles were big and mammals were small, underfoot, squeezed by the oppression of tyrant lizard kings, and then, when the dinosaurs died out, mammals could get big finally and take over. And that's approximately true. But also, before the dinosaurs evolved, in the Permian period, terrestrial ecosystems were actually dominated by apex predators who were early synapsids, and much more closely related to mammals. This paper took a look at the evolutionary trajectory of carnivorous synapsids in those carnivorous roles. What they found was that these Permian synapsid carnivores started out pretty diverse. There was a good spread of generalists, small prey specialists, and large prey specialists. But over the course of the Permian, these synapsid carnivores increasingly 
converged on these large-bodied apex predator, large prey specialist roles, which sounds like a definition of success, until you get hit by a mass extinction and suddenly there are not enough calories of energy in the entire food chain to be had to sustain that lifestyle. And then after the end Permian mass extinction, it was those smaller reptilian carnivores that evolved into the dinosaurs and took over most terrestrial ecosystems. I think this is a really cool story for two reasons. First, because it contradicts what I think would be most people's assumptions about what it means for a lineage to be successful. Like, turns out being an apex predator is a terrible long-term strat. And also because it mirrors what happened to the dinosaurs in the end Cretaceous mass extinction. And that's what we learned in Fair. February. I just punched my lamp. It's cool. It's cool. Um, anyway, thanks again to Edge for inviting me to be part of this. Check out Bethany Burke Franklin and Benji Thomas's videos, which will be dropping tomorrow for March 2024. Also, did you like the video? Did I do a good job? I came here from TikTok and I'm trying to do the whole YouTube thing, so if you want to encourage me to keep talking about bones on here, give me attention about it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment. Tell me what I did well. Tell me what I did badly. Tell me, wow, I can't believe they made young Sheldon a butch chick with dinosaur autism. That's fine. I know that I remind you of young Sheldon. Uh, <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>